Amen. As I was uh, praying and seeking the Lord, you know, it's been many years, you know, this is our, this is our 27th year as, as a church, and uh, I've been pastor all that time, so how many of you know I preached a lot of Resurrection Sunday services, amen? And so, uh, but either, either way, I pray and ask God to help me to show me exactly what He wants me to share at any given time, because we want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, and God knows every single person uh, that's going to be here, and what every single person needs, amen? And so we're going to try to do that and be obedient. Uh, uh, obedient to the Lord. And so I've entitled the message, uh, Who is this Jesus? How many of you know uh, that a lot of people all over the world today uh, are celebrating Jesus and uh, some of them, perhaps most of them, understand who he is, but there's a whole lot of folks that don't really know who Jesus is. In fact, increasingly, it seems that even in our country, uh, if you mention Jesus, there's young people today, especially, that don't even know who you're talking about. The only time they've ever heard the name of Jesus or Jesus Christ, perhaps, has been used as a as a curse word or something like that. And so uh, we're living in a different day than when I was a boy, when I was a, a, a teenager even. It's a very different day today. And so we never want to take anything for granted. We want to help people understand who is this Jesus uh, that we're celebrating today and, and get a better understanding. Obviously, in one time, a one-time message cannot in any way uh, do it justice in terms of conveying uh, the message of who Jesus is. But we're going to uh, attempt to share the things the Lord would have us share. Notice uh, Jesus here in Matthew chapter 16 up on the big screen uh, verses 13 through 16. Now most of the scriptures today I'm going to have up on the screen because I know we have guests and a lot of times guests are not used to bringing Bibles or whatever. I might have us turn uh, to a few for those of us that have a Bible. But in Matthew chapter 16 13 through 16 notice uh, what it states here. It says when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi he asked his disciples saying who do men say that I the son of man am? And so Jesus is inquisitive. He said he's saying and asking his disciples, who do people out there uh, say that I am? I think that's a good question to ask even today. What do people think about Jesus? I ask you today, who is Jesus? Who, do, who is Jesus to you? And, and how do you understand this person, Jesus Christ? And as Jesus went on, it says, so, or as they went on, it says, so they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? And that's a question that I ask each and every one of us here this morning. Who do you say uh, that he is? Who do you say this Jesus is? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And so Peter had a revelation, really, a revelation by the Spirit of God as to who Jesus was. Of course, later on, just in that same discourse, Jesus, uh, Peter got himself into a little bit of trouble, but he had a revelation from God. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. One author said this, as you can see up on the screen, uh, Stephen Prothero, he's an author. He said this in the book of Genesis. God creates humans in his own image. In the United States, Americans have created Jesus over and over in theirs. And so again, if we look at this or think about this idea, you know, God created man in his image, but now today in America especially... It seems that Americans want to create Jesus in their own image. We have politicians sometimes uh, that try to tell us what Jesus would do in certain circumstances and, and what they say Jesus would do under certain circumstances in no means represents the Jesus of the Bible who is the Jesus you and I serve today if we're believers in Jesus Christ. Amen? And so it's so easy for uh, politicians or, or people that are celebrities to say, well, I don't believe Jesus would do that. That. I don't believe Jesus would say that or anything like that. But they many times have no clue about the real Jesus. What have they done? They've created a Jesus in their image, in the image that they want him to be. But what we want to do is understand who the true and real Jesus Christ is. Amen? And the only way uh, that we can find out and know who the real and true Jesus Christ is is to search the scriptures and find out what it has to say about him and what he had to say and what he did. And therefore, we'll know him and the real him is who we want to know. Amen? Amen. John Bevere said this in his uh, uh, book, A Heart Ablaze. He said, a thought has been running through my spirit for several years that I just cannot shake. That is, we have served a Jesus in the image we have made. We call him Lord. We acknowledge his saving, healing, and delivering power. But is he the one sitting on the right hand of majesty on high? Or is he a Jesus that we have made more in the image of ourselves and still call Lord? 
And this is something that we need to really think about. And no matter how long we've been Christians, we need to really think about. We need to reevaluate what we think about the Lord Jesus Christ and begin to know and understand him in a better way. Even Christians today, they see him sometimes in a way uh, that makes him look almost like a Santa Claus. Almost like, you know, a guy that's always out there just wanting to give gifts with no commitment on the side of the Christian. No commitment on the side of the Christian, but yet uh, he's just a gift giver. He just wants to bless all the time. Uh, but what about things like the fact the Bible says that we're to fear God. We're to reverence him. We're to seek his kingdom first and his righteousness and then all things will be added unto us, right? And so he's not like a Santa Claus that just wants to pour out blessings all the time. No, he's looking for people whose hearts are committed toward him. Are you following me here today? Amen? And yes, he is one who wants to bless his people, but not at the expense of their character, not at the expense of their commitment to him, not at the expense of their eternity. He does not want to bless people. Are you following me? Amen. And so often I think even Christians uh, get a little bit messed up as to their image, their idea about who Jesus is. And so let's start off a little bit. And again, we can't do it justice in one session, but let's start off just a little bit talking about what did Jesus say he was or who did Jesus say uh, that he was. And, and again, how many of you would think, if you think Jesus is Lord, wouldn't you think that he must know who he was, right? And so first and foremost, and the one we're going to major on. And there's other things that would go with this, but uh, we want to emphasize this. Jesus claimed to be God. He claimed to be God. This is an amazing thing when you think about the culture in which he lived. That Jewish culture uh, with the Jews worshiping Yahweh and, and really uh, having this uh, a firm and strong religion and, and all of that. They knew who uh, God was. Not many of them seemed to really know God. How many of you know you can know who he is but not know him? Right? And, and so we have this understanding, Jesus coming. And, and really, some people today, they'll say, Jesus never claimed to be God. People that say that Jesus never claimed to be God, they don't know their Bibles. Jesus claimed to be God repeatedly. He claimed to be the Messiah repeatedly. And, and so again, we need to understand that a lot of things that people think are not necessarily the truth. I don't know about you, I always wanted to know the truth. That doesn't mean I always had the truth. That just means I always wanted to know the truth. We need to be seekers of truth. We need to search out truth. We need to have hearts that say, God, if I need correction, I'm going to be corrected. God, if I'm going the wrong direction, I want to go the right direction. God, help me. Help me. My life is in your hands. Amen? Amen. And so that's our heart. That should be our heart. Uh, notice C.S. Lewis said this. Uh, some of you may have heard of C.S. Lewis if you uh, saw the Narnia movies or uh, there was another movie about his life. But C.S. Lewis was at one time an atheist and he became a strong believer and a defender of the faith of Christianity. And C.S. Lewis said this. Among these Jews there suddenly turns up a man who goes about talking as if he was God. He claims to forgive sins. He says he has always existed. He says he's coming to judge the world at the end of time. Now let us get this clear. Among pantheists, like the Indians, anyone might say that he was a part of God or one with God. There would be nothing very odd about it. But this man, since he was a Jew, could not mean that kind of God. God in their language meant the being outside the world who had made it and was infinitely different from anything else. And when you have grasped that, you will see that what this man said was quite simply the most shocking thing that had ever been uttered by human lips. And so no wonder the religious leaders of that day, the Pharisees in particular, the rulers of the Jews, no wonder they were shocked by Jesus and threatened by Jesus. Here was Jesus coming and basically saying, I am Yahweh, I'm Jehovah. And you can see that they would uh, probably be adverse to that, but yet he proved who he was in so many ways by performing the miraculous, by setting people free, by doing so many things to, to demonstrate, uh, not only by words, but by the power of God that he was indeed the creator as well. Amen? Amen? God became a man to dwell amongst us in order so that we might be set free, in order so that God could be the one as a man to take the, the, the sin of all humanity. He took your sin, the judgment for it, upon himself. He took my judgment that I deserved upon himself. A regular man couldn't do that, but God becoming man out of his great love and compassion and mercy for you and I, he became a man to bear yours and my penalty that he had no sin of his own, but he bore it for you and me. And that's why we rejoice today. That's why we rejoice today. Amen. 
Amen. And you know what? If that's old news to you, then it's not real. It's not genuine to you. It hasn't, rea it hasn't become reality uh, to you because when it's reality to you, it doesn't matter how many times you've heard this good news, you still are rejoicing over it. Amen. Amen. Notice what it says in John chapter 8, 54 through 59, a little lengthy, but hopefully you'll bear with me here. Jesus answered, if I glorify myself, my glory is nothing. It is my Father who glorifies me, of whom you say he is our God. But you have not known him. Now he's speaking again to the religious leaders of that day. And in the same context, he says that they are of their father, the devil, because they wanted to murder him, and they were liars. And again, it says this, of whom you say he is our God, but you have not known him. I know him. If I were to say that I do not know him, I would be a liar like you. Oh, but you know, so many people in the world today say, Jesus would never call anybody a liar. He called people liars lots of times when they were lying. Amen. He said, I would be a liar like you, but I do not know him, and I keep his word. Your father Abraham rejoiced. Notice this phrase. Your father Abraham rejoiced that he would see my day. He saw it and was glad. So the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. So they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. There is no doubt about it in this context. Jesus is saying to those Jews that I am the I am. I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. There is no mincing words here. Jesus revealed to them uh, who he was and obviously their reaction of wanting to pick up stones to kill him. You know, there were basically three reasons in the Bible indicated to us as to why they wanted to kill Jesus. One reason was because he loved sinners. He was the friend of sinners. And they hated that idea because they had this haughty and lofty religious attitude uh, that made them think they were better uh, than those little uh, minions, those little uh, sinners that, that Jesus loved and spent time with and, and showed compassion toward. They hated him because of that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm trying, brother. I'm trying, pastor. I'm trying, man. Amen. And, and so the first thing is he loved sinners. The second thing was sometimes he, did, he had the goal, the, the goal to heal on the Sabbath day. To heal on the Sabbath day. He had this, uh, you know, what, 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 who would have the audacity to heal on the Sabbath day? Now, anybody you would think with a logical, rational mind would say, wait a minute, this guy, these people, like the man with the withered hand comes to my mind. Uh, this man was withered in his hand for years and years. We saw him, we witnessed him, uh, we, we knew him, and now his hand stretched forth, becomes whole and well. Wouldn't you think a logical, rational person would say, well, you know, maybe he really is God. And maybe we really shouldn't come against this idea. It must be God must think it's okay to heal on the Sabbath. But how many of you know religion will blind you? Religion will mess up your thinking. Are you hearing me here? Amen. It'll cause you not to see straight. And so uh, the second reason, first reason is he loves sinners. Second reason was uh, because he healed on the Sabbath sometimes. And the third reason was is right here. He called himself God. And they hated him for it. They wanted to kill him. They plotted continually how they might kill Jesus. But notice again in the, in the, in the uh, other color here on the screen, truly, truly, Jesus said, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. Now notice where this comes from, Exodus chapter 3, 13 through 14. It says, then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, what is his name? And so God, Moses is saying to God, God, when I go to Israel, who do I I say your name is and notice what God says what shall I say to them and God said to Moses I am who I am and he said this he said thus you shall say to the children of Israel I am has sent me to you what does I am mean I am means I'm the timeless one I am means I'm the one that always was and always will be. I am means I'm the one from eternity past. I'm the ancient of days. I'm the one who has been, is, and always will be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I am the Alpha and the Omega. I am the beginning and the end. Amen. That's what he meant when he said, I am who I am. And so again, this became understood as God himself. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He's not saying before Abraham was, I am, uh, as far as I, I am now. He says, I am, in other words, before Abraham. Can you imagine before Abraham? 
Hundreds of years before, he said, I already was. Why? Because Jesus is the eternal God. Always was, always will be. Notice some other I am statements of Jesus, and there's many other ones, but these are some that all of you have probably heard one time or another. Notice, he said, I am the bread of life. Listen to me, he was saying more than just this analogy or metaphor, I should say. He was saying more when he said, I'm the bread of life. He was referring to the bread that fell from heaven for Israel called manna. And how when they were in that wilderness and wandering in that wilderness, they were uh, longing for food and wanting to be fed. And God fed them supernaturally and sent manna uh, from heaven. And that manna from heaven, Jesus said, that was symbolic of me. That represented me. That I am the manna from heaven. I am the one that gives life. I'm the one that gives sustenance. I'm the one uh, that'll carry you through uh, when you feel like you need energy, when you need strength. I'm the one that gives you strength, like food will give you strength. Are you hearing me here? He said, I am the bread of life. Again, uh, showing and indicating his deity that he is God. He said, I am the light of the world. How many of you know the world lies in darkness? The world is in darkness even to this day. But Jesus, that some 2,000 years ago, he brought light into the darkness like had never been seen before. He brought light into that darkness. Now, Jesus did say that men love darkness rather than light, but he's looking for those who will love the light, looking for those that will love uh, what life is all about, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? The Bible says that those that do not know him are walking in darkness, but those that do know him are called children of light. In fact, he told his disciples, and it applies to you and me as well, before he ascended, he's saying to them, he's saying, you are now the light of the world. So what did he do? He was the light of the world when he walked on earth and now he says to his followers you are the light of the world you're to let your light so shine among men that they might see your good works and glorify your father who's in heaven and so as believers we're called to let our light shine to let the life of God be shown in us that Jesus has changed our lives I'll tell you your actions your way your life speaks louder than any of your words amen so he says I am I am Jehovah, I am Yahweh, I'm the self-existent one, I'm the one that always was. I am the bread of life, I'm the light of the world, I am the door. He's the door into the sheepfold. If you're going to come into the sheepfold, in other words, in the family of God, you've got to come by way of the door, there's only one door. There's only one door, and he is that door. He said, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, and how many of you know that he said continually on that, or as it continued, he said, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Like the shepherds of of Israel that protected the sheep from the wolves and the enemy, Jesus was the one and is the one who shepherds our life. He directs, he'll guide our life. Don't you remember Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul, etc. Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd to guide us, to direct us, uh, to to make sure we're, we're strong in him. Amen. Are you following me here today? And so he's still our shepherd today, but he's the I am who is the good shepherd. Again, this is indicative. This is him uh, describing the fact that he is God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It goes on in that verse and says, and no man comes to the Father except by me. You can't get to God any other way but by the way of Jesus Christ. There is no other way to get to him. He said, I am the way, not a way. He said, I am the life, not a life. I am the truth, not a truth. There's only one truth, and that's the truth of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me here? In terms of salvation, the truth of Jesus Christ, all of these, again, showing him as the I am that I am. I am the true vine. And we are the branches, it says, those that are connected to him. And it's by way of the vine that we receive life. Much of this has to do with the receiving of life. And then he said, I am the resurrection and the life. In terms of, or in the context of Lazarus, Lazarus, who was a friend of his and his sisters, Mary and Martha, you know, uh, Lazarus had died. And uh, uh, Mary, uh, or excuse me, Martha comes up to him. I think it was, maybe it was Mary. One of his sisters comes up and says, if only you'd been here. Our brother would not have died. And Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He is the resurrection and the life. And then he proceeded to raise Lazarus from the dead. And boy, the religious leaders didn't like that either, did they? Wouldn't you think? they think, wow, maybe he is God. Maybe he is God. He raises the dead. He heals the sick. He cleanses the leper. Maybe he is God. 
Who do men say that I am, Jesus said. Who do men say that I am? Notice other scriptures about this. It says, therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. What's he saying? He's saying I'm God, I'm the Savior, I'm the Messiah. If you don't believe in me, you will die in your sins. It said in John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. What an amazing phrase, what an amazing word. He said if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said if you've seen me, you've seen God. If you've seen me, you've seen God. You want to know God's character? You want to know what God thinks of you? You want to know uh, how he acts? Uh, you look at Jesus in the Gospels. You can find out his heart. You can find out the heart of God. And, and when you think about Jesus going about doing good, healing all who are oppressed of the devil, I want you to know that that is exemplifying God because he was in his God. He still wants to heal you. He still wants to deliver you. He still wants to set you free. And more important than anything else, he wants you to be free from the bondage of sin. And he wants you to be forgiven. He wants you to receive that forgiveness uh, that he has provided. He also said, I and the Father are one. And think about all the religious folks getting upset about this. Father, glorify me. John 17, 5 in this prayer. He said, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Again, he is saying he's God. Why? Because he was around before the world began. Certainly he was. In fact, other scriptures say that all the world was created by Jesus Christ. So who do men say that I am? Who do you say that he is? John 5, 17, my father is always at his work to this very day, and I too am working. Let's just look at some things now. There's more that Jesus said about who he was. But what did Jesus say he came to do? And again, this again will not cover everything possibly, but it'll cover the more important things for us on this day. What did Jesus say he came to do? I'm going to give you several scriptures. First of all, God did not send his son. Jesus is speaking. God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God didn't send his son to bring condemnation on the world. He didn't send his son to condemn the world to hell. He sent his son to save the world from hell. He sent his son to save the world from condemnation. Amen? Because of his love and his mercy. He goes on in that passage, Jesus does, and he says the world is condemned already. The world is condemned because of their sin, not because God condemns them, because, but because of their sin, the Bible says they're condemned. But Jesus came to save them from their sin. And to save them from their sin is to save them from condemnation as well. Amen? Amen. And so on to the next one. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, you know, I don't know where your, what your condition is today. Uh, but if you are lost, that means that you don't know Jesus Christ in a personal way. You might know him as a historical figure. You might recognize him as someone that you were taught in Sunday school or, or catechism or whatever the case may be. You might know him in that way. But do you know him in a personal way? Do you know and believe in him like you believe in a historical figure like George Washington or Abraham Lincoln? Or do you believe in him as not only a part of history, but also a part of eternity, a part of today, a part of the fact that he is Lord and Savior today and he's alive today? Amen? Because every other historical figure, every other one of days gone by has died. And their grave can be found, most of them. If not, their grave is somewhere if it can't be found. But there is one grave. There is one tomb that is empty. There's one grave, one tomb that has, been, that, has been, that has had the stone rolled away. And now when you look here, the body is gone. Amen? And you know, the interesting thing about that is this, that if they wanted to debunk the, the disciples' message, if they wanted to debunk what they said when they went out and said, He's risen, He's risen, and they rejoiced, all they had to do, all they had to do is come up with the body, and all of Christianity would have been wiped off the scene. Isn't that right? But they couldn't find the body. Why? Because the body was resurrected. He is risen, and he is risen indeed. Amen? He is alive and alive forevermore. And think about the fact that the church of Jesus Christ still exists today. Can you imagine a world without the church? And the church, I'm, talking about, I'm not talking about a denomination. I'm talking about the true church. All those, no matter what group they're a part of, that have accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. The work of the church throughout history has been amazing. 
They have in many ways brought the light. They brought the light of the gospel and nations have, uh, almost all nations have been saved in some cases and, and people have been set free. They have built hospitals. Christianity has brought hospitals. They have brought orphanages. Uh, they have brought uh, rescue centers. Uh, they have brought so many things to the world that would otherwise not be in the world today. Why? Because when Jesus changes a man and a woman's heart, there's a heart of compassion that rises up and we see the needs of the hurting and we want to reach out and help in any way that we can. Isn't that right? Without the coming of Jesus Christ, there would be a darker world than you can ever imagine today, if it existed at all at this point. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He said this in Luke 5, 32, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. What does that mean? That means he did not come to, to call the self-righteous. And he's really, again, referring to the religious leaders. How many of you know self-righteousness does not cut it with God? No, the Bible says we need to humble ourselves before the Lord our God. We need to humble ourselves and turn from our sin and turn to Him and acknowledge the fact that we need Him. Many people never come to Christ because of pride uh, that is in their hearts. They're lifted up with pride. They're lifted up with haughtiness. They're lifted up with an idea, I don't need God, I don't need anybody, I can do it on my own, but that will never happen. That'll never make it to heaven. That'll never make it. You've got to bow to Him. You've got to acknowledge Him. You've got to declare Him as Lord and, and surrender your life to Jesus Christ. Amen? Who do men say that I am? He asked that question even today. And going on, Jesus said, John 10, 17 through 18, he said, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. We're talking about why did he come? Why did he come? Why did he have to die? He said, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. He laid it down, but notice he said in that passage that I might take it up again. And so he did it, certainly do so. He took it up again. Let, let's go on with the next one. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To give his life a ransom. We understand that word ransom fairly well. That word ransom is a price that is paid in order to set those in captivity free. And that's exactly what Jesus came to do. He said, I didn't come to serve, but to serve. To give my life. To give my life so that a ransom might be paid so the prisoners might be set free. We come to another question. What, why do we need or why did we need Jesus to come? First of all, going along with this idea of ransom, the human race has been taken captive. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you are captive to the adversary. You are captive to the enemy. Notice what the Apostle Paul said to Timothy one day. 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, it reads, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. Notice that phrase, correcting those who are in opposition. If God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. Notice the description the Apostle Paul gives to those that do not know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. He says concerning them uh, that they are in opposition to the truth, uh, that they uh, have, to have to come to their senses, that they have to be able to escape the snare of the enemy because they've been taken captive by the enemy. And the only way you're going to escape that captivity is by bowing and surrendering your life to Jesus Christ and no longer opposing truth but acknowledging the truth of what Jesus Christ came to do. Amen. Are you hearing me? Amen. And so again, those that don't know Christ, those that are in bondage, all of humanity was in bondage and captivity. Jesus came to pay a ransom. The ransom was the ransom paid of his blood. His blood was shed. His life was given. He paid the debt that you and I could not pay so that we could be free the second reason along with this is we all have sinned. Why did Jesus have to come? Why did we need him to come? We all have sinned against God and as such are under death's penalty. The Bible says, as many of you probably aware of this, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everybody has sinned. What does sin mean? Sin means you've disobeyed God. It means that you've missed the mark. It means you failed the law of God. It means you haven't kept up to God's uh, uh, standards. And how many of you know I can lift my hand and say I've never kept up to God's standards. I've never been able to be, be perfect in any way. I've sinned. I've fallen short. I have failed God. And because I've failed God and I've sinned, I needed a Savior from that sin. How about you? Amen. 
Amen. Notice what Romans 5 says in verse 12. It says, Therefore, just as through one man's sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. And so it says by one man, that's speaking of Adam, our original father, if you will. By Adam, we all had sin entered into the human race. And because sin entered into us, it's not talking about the, the actions of sins, first of all. It's talking about a nature of sin. There's a nature of sin uh, that has come into each and every one of us. And that nature of sin has separated us from the Lord our God. That nature came into the human race when Adam fell. And we're all born with this fallen nature. That's why you can do all the religious work you want. You can do all the good works you want to do. You could, you could give to the poor. You could go to church every Sunday. You could read your Bible. But unless your nature is changed, unless something changes on the inside, unless you become a new creation, as the Bible says, a new man, a new woman, by receiving Christ as Lord and allow His Spirit to regenerate you and make you born again or a new birth happening on the inside, unless you receive that, you're still lost and you'll never get to heaven uh, by just trying to earn it some other way. Isn't that right? And so these things are essential for us to understand because when we talk about Christianity, we're not talking about religion. I know there's a religious, a religious side to some Christianity, but I'm talking about real Christianity. I'm talking about biblical Christianity. It's not about religion. It's about a living relationship with a living Savior to come into our hearts and lives and to give us life and help us to show that new life to others so that they might share in that life as well. So we have all sinned against God and as such are under a death penalty. We're under a death penalty. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. Sin, nextly says, has separated man from God. Isaiah 59, 2 says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not hear. And so sin separates us. But thank God Jesus came to break that separation, to reconcile us to God. I'll tell you the story, the gospel, the good news of Christianity is beyond compare. There's nothing that compares to this message. There's nothing compared to this truth. No other religion provides this, this bridge to connect man with God again except through Jesus Christ. Amen? The wisdom that we see in this, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And then we come to this. The blood of Jesus Christ has rescued us from captivity. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 21 reads this way. Knowing that you were not redeemed. That means ransomed. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He had no sin of his own. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Eternity but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Amen. Again, you can't have faith in your ability or your works. You can only have your faith and hope in Almighty God and by faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Galatians 1.4 says this, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to rescue us from this evil world in which we live. 1 Timothy 2.6 says he gave his life to purchase freedom for everyone. This is the message God gave to the world at just the right time. Titus 2.14, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his, own, his very own people totally committed to doing good deeds. He gave himself for you. He loved you so much. He gave to set you free from your sin and bondage, condemnation, and many other things. After dying, of course, and this is what we celebrate today, he rose again. How many of you know it's, a, it's one complete work? His death and burial and resurrection, one complete work. If he had only died, it wouldn't be enough. Isn't that right? Yes. Notice this. To help us understand, on the cross, he shed his blood and bore the penalty for our sin. He defeated the power of sin on the cross. But in his resurrection, he showed us that justice had been served and death has been defeated. You see, some of you have heard me say before, you and I have two enemies, basically. I know Satan is ultimately an enemy, but we have two enemies. And those two enemies in this context is sin and death. Sin and death. 
Men have tried to conquer both for ages and centuries, but there's only one way to conquer them, and that is by putting faith in the one who did conquer them. On the cross, Jesus defeated sin by taking the judgment of sin. On his resurrection, he defeated death so that you and I, though we die, will not stay dead because someday you and I will rise again as well. Are you hearing me here today? Amen? He's the first fruits. He's the first one uh, to rise again uh, in an immortality in that kind of way. And you and I will follow suit if we believe on Jesus, if, we're, uh, if we die uh, before he comes. If we don't die uh, before he comes, praise God, we're not going to resurrect in that way. We're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And, and this mortal will put on immortality. Amen? Why did Jesus need to rise again? And I'm almost done, so just bear with me for a moment here. If he didn't raise from the dead, we are still dead in our sins because it was an incomplete work if he didn't rise from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Notice what this author said. Very important. Notice, if the resurrection is not historical fact, and it is, and there's many reasons, many evidences why the resurrection is a historical fact and many things that we could look at with that as far as forensic evidence, historical evidence uh, of his resurrection. First and foremost, there were over 500 people that saw him after he had died. They saw him risen. How many of you know eyewitnesses is a powerful tool? Amen? It says, if the resurrection is not historical fact, then the power of death remains unbroken, and with it the effect of sin. And the significance of Christ's death remains uncertified. Notice that. The significance of Christ's death remains uncertified. And accordingly, believers are yet in their sin, precisely where they were before they heard of Jesus' name. Of course, you and I know that it is a fact, though, and that we are set free from sin, and that we have forgiveness, and we are delivered, and now, praise God, we live a new life. Amen? Amen. Now notice why did he raise from the dead the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the guarantee of our resurrection as well. And it says in 1 Corinthians 15, 21 and 22, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. There is coming a resurrection. Next, Christ's resurrection is the seal of proof that he was who he said he was. Notice this, the seal of proof that he was who he said he was. Notice what this theologian said very carefully. Now, just bear with me. This theologian said this, If our Lord said frequently with great def definite definiteness, definity or whatever, and detail that after he went up to Jerusalem, he would be put to death, but on the third day he would rise again from the grave. If he said that, and this prediction came to pass that it has always seemed to me that everything else that our Lord ever said must also be true. I mean, if you think about that, if he said he was going to die and rise again, and he did, would you believe everything else he said must be true as well? Amen. And so what are some of the things that he said? He said, I go to prepare a place for you, to you that are fellow believers in him. He has prepared and is preparing a place for you and I as well that we may dwell uh, together with him forever. He said in John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you will and it shall be done unto you if you're abiding in him and his words are abiding in you. He said in Mark 16, 17, and these signs will follow them who believe in my name. They'll cast out demons, they'll speak with new tongues, they'll lay hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. What else did he say? He said, yet a little while and the world sees me no more but you see me because I live you shall also live and then John 3 and verse 3 he said most assuredly I say to you unless one is born again he cannot see the kingdom of God in order to be saved from sin Satan and hell one must believe in their heart that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead one must be born again, as we read in John chapter 3 and verse 3. Let me give you a little background of John 3. We won't go there. A fellow by the name of Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee, came to Jesus by night because he was afraid of the other Pharisees and what they might think. So at night, he snuck in there to see Jesus. He was a religious man, steeped in his religion, the Jewish religion, and understood the Old Testament scriptures. As I understand it, Pharisees had to have, one of the requirements was they had to memorize the first five books of the Old Testament. That's quite a feat all by itself. And so he was steeped in the scripture, steeped in the word of God. And Nicodemus went to Jesus and he said to Jesus essentially this. He said, Master, I know that you must be of God because no one can do the works that you have done unless, unless, uh, unless you are of God, right? And so Jesus uh, turned and said to him, I say unto you, you must be born again if you're going to see the kingdom of God. 
if Jesus rose from the dead, if he died and rose like he said he was going to, then when he said you must be born again, he meant it and it's true. Again, we're not talking about joining a church. We're not talking about joining a religion. We're talking about joining a family, the family of God, by being born into the family of God. Final verse, Romans 10, 9 through 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Notice the essential part of that. You believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. And so we ask this question, who is Jesus? Who do you say that he is? Do you think that he's just a good moral teacher, like some people think today? I submit to you that if Jesus was just a good moral teacher, then he didn't qualify if, that's, if you know the real Jesus because a real moral teacher wouldn't have said the things he said if they weren't true. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Do you think he was just a great philosopher or whatever the case may be? Well, let me tell you something. He was more than any of that. He was a man, but he was more than a man. He was God who became a man out of his love, recognizing and acknowledging that only the sinless one, a sinless one, could bear the sin of those who were sinful. Someone once said, the Son of God became the Son of Man so that the sons of men might become sons of God by receiving him as Lord and Savior. Amen. If you've been blessed by this message today, please prayerfully consider giving to help support the ministry of Abounding Grace Christian Church. No gift is too small, and we'll agree with you in prayer that God will continue to bless you richly for your support. If you'd like to give online, go to agcc.church. The link is found below, and look for the green tab near the top that says Give Online. Or you can send your gift by mail to the address also below. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos coming in the future. And thank you so much, and God bless.